we're supposed to be okay by this noon month. time. I know it's supposed to be okay by noon time, but in October twenty first is the next uh, party. Okay. November eighteenth, December sixteenth. Uh, go to the uh, Mount Wilson uh, website. You can get all those dates. I'm sorry, Griffith. Thank you. This is this is why I have these people in keep me straight here. Uh, Daryl, <laughs> you didn't. So on the on the uh, on the Unistellar night, uh, let's get some of our other people. I'm going to bring my Stalina, but we should get some of our other people there. And the Boy Scouts are going to be there, so the more telescopes, the merrier. Uh, also, the city is advertising that on their website, and there was something else that was going to get uh, some uh, a credit for that. So it could be a very, very busy night. Also, I saw, I think, two things in the last month with uh, Spencer and Tim on TV. Uh, so a lot's happening. People online heard that. So uh, the last 100 inch night was canceled. So unfortunately, the 200 inch nights that I booked for this year were both clouded out. Really? Yes, sir. Question okay. Point. Please do. Uh, the two 60 inch nights that are left for the year are both full. Um, and I have a couple of people on waiting lists. So that's probably going to be it for this year. Uh, let's see. Are the uh, Zoom people up? Okay. Let's hey, see. Darryl. Do I have any other announcements? Uh, yeah, Daryl. This is yeah, Dave. I look. Hey, Daryl. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, I sent you and Tim email, but I've yet to receive a, a message back. I checked the Griffith website. They don't list public star parties for October, November, or December. So are we having those that night? And could you inform Griffith? I tried, but could you inform Griffith they need to update their website? Because check, check your email, Tim did answer you, and we are having star parties for the rest of the year. Okay. Okay? Very okay. Cool. All right. Um, hi, everybody online, hadn't seen you before. Uh, so this evening, we don't have our tickets in house so i'm not sure how we're going to do the raffle um maybe we'll do next month and double it double the presents or something so the other thing that i wanted to uh, announce is uh something that i've been working on since maybe march or april um uh, spencer can you put up the the slides there sure the hang, first the, hang first, on, the hang, first one hang on one second let me just right. uh, get do the screen share okay so about a year ago we had in the board meeting, we were talking about, we better start figuring out what we're gonna do for the 100 year anniversary of LAIS. And it got me to thinking about what was gonna happen for the next 100 years. So can everybody see this? Are you okay, seeing no. the screen now? Yep, sure are. All right, so this is our current property in Lockwood. Um, everyone who's been there knows what all that is. If, for the people who haven't, all the little round circles are actually uh, almost eight foot concrete circles for people to set their telescopes up on. There's a big telescope in the roll off in the center. Uh, there's a gigantic Dobsonian uh, pad that we put in there in the middle. And the last family night was really crowded. It was Perseids, and I understand that's more, but we got, I think, over 70 people. So this site is not going to hold us for another 100 years. So I was looking at the site next to us on the north. And there was some discrepancy about that because there's a road right there. And you know, on, the, on the maps, it looks like the road should actually be our property, but it looks like an easement. So what I did was I contacted the guy who owns the property to the north of us, which is a five acre property, double our size, but completely different in orientation. We're very, very close. I have been e texting with this guy for the past, um, since, since March. And uh, yesterday, I went to his house and got the signature on the form to get started with the you know, escrow. So we're going to purchase this property, it looks like, unless something goes through. The main reason uh, that we are buying this property is because it has a working well. And it has a, a tank. Uh, 
we can't do anything in the future without permanent water supply per county you know, rules. If we want to do something on any, even on our property, we're going to need permanent water supply. So we are going to have one. Um, the, the price went up and down a couple of times, uh, um, but it ended up back down. I'm sorry? Uh, it ended up back down, and it's looking like that we're going to be able to purchase that five acres for $22,000. And we have a, um, a donor who wishes to remain anonymous that is going to cover that and a few extras. I think he's sending us a check for 25000 so we're going to do this. You have a question? There's no power on the property. There is nothing there. There's a well, and that's it. My, my intention is for now to acquire the property, and that's it. We're having a lot of problems with the county, with our own property. Almost everything you see on there is not compliant. We're going to have to take almost everything off the property, go back to almost the way we were uh, camping and uh, almost nothing, but outhouses for a while until we figure something else out. So we're going backwards a little bit, uh, but it's the consequence of around 1980, everyone stopping pulling permits for anything. So, so we're paying the price now. However, I think it's all gonna come out okay. We, you know, we're gonna be compliant. We're gonna take care of that. Uh, do we have one more slide, uh, one more picture, uh, Spencer? Yep, here you okay. go. All right, so we're zooming out so you can see uh, an important thing. <clears throat> at the end of the, first of all, the property next to us, the com different orientation, it's, it's only 220 feet on the short side, but it's 990 feet on the long side. So it's, it's five acres. It's a big, big lot. Now, if you go down the road that's behind our fence and you keep going, that road goes all the way down another few thousand yards to another road that goes right back out to Boy Scout Camp Road. So a lot of our problems about maybe headlights being a problem, people can leave another direction. So we have a, a, another way in or out the east end of that property. Uh, I'm sorry, the west end of that property is quite clear of trees and the other end is not. So we're going to do something with this, nothing right away. That's the big announcement. We have another five acres on a well, and that's going to keep us alive for the next hundred years. Thank you. Thanks. It was, uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that I have anything else that we need to talk about. Uh, we should go right to the guest speaker then, I guess. Uh, okay. Tim, you want to introduce him? Sure. All right. Here comes Tim to introduce our speaker. As most of you know, I've been involved with Mount Wilson Observatory like forever. And one of the legacies of Mount Wilson Observatory is Palomar Observatory, which has an even bigger telescope, the biggest one in all of California. And our guest speaker tonight, Steve Flanders, is the man in charge of public outreach and docents and the like at Palomar Observatory, and he's going to talk to us about the history of the observatory so you can see how it connects with Matt Wilson, and you'll say a few things about the current science. So, Steve, yes. you're on. Jim, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everybody for asking me to speak tonight. Um, yeah, we've got We'll talk about the building of the observatory and then do a, a very awkward transition to talk about ship all the way up to the uh, modern science, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and spend a few minutes on talking about the research that's going on here. Um, and with that, let me share my screen. Well, remember, got to remember how to do it too. There we go. And is that showing? I hope. Not yet. Really? It's showing on my screen. Yeah, I can see it perfectly well. I see uh, it. Yeah, it's just come up now. Okay. 
built built delays into the system, I guess. Okay. Well. Well, he hello to all the members of Los Angeles Astronomical Society. I'm Steve Flanders, and I run the public outreach program at Palomar Observatory. This evening, I'd like to spend some time talking about the building of the observatory and the 200-inch telescope, and then finish my part of tonight's meeting with a brief summary of research that is now going on there. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. It's a pleasure to meet everyone, and thank you for allowing me to join your meeting. This is an outline for the presentation. And yeah, Spencer, can you make him uh, full screen so that we don't see everything? Everything, we all right? Okay, it's an outline for the presentation. Part one, it's building of the observatory and the various stages it went through to completion. And part two, summary of the current research. First of all, for part one, the observatory is owned and operated by the California Institute of Technology. Caltech is a private, not-for-profit research and educational institute. The Hale Telescope was built with a $6 million grant obtained from the Rockefeller Foundation in 1928 by George Ellery Hale. Hale died in 1938, and when the telescope was dedicated in 1948, it was named in his honor. Well, Hale was an astrophysicist and a solar astronomer. He is considered by many to be the founder of modern astrophysics. The inventor of the spectroheliograph, Hale discovered that sunspots are the centers of strong magnetic fields, the first detection of a magnetic field beyond the Earth. Hale was a founder of Mount Wilson Observatory and later of the California Institute of Technology. Most famously, Hale has also had a talent for getting money out of rich folks for big telescopes. Altogether, he built the largest telescope in the world four times. And in each case, he did it using other people's money, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's and others. Hale's first telescopes pictured here, the Yerkes 40 inch refractor completed in 1897, the 60 inch reflector at Mount Wilson in 1908, and the 100 inch hooker reflector at Mount Wilson in 1917, probably the most important and most productive scientific instrument of the first half of the 20th century. Well, in April, 1928, Hale began a public campaign that he hoped would generate interest in his proposal for a new and larger telescopes. He told a simple story. We are on a voyage of exploration and discovery and transported by our great telescopes, we are venturing upon a universe vastly larger than anyone had supposed even a decade earlier. A larger telescope, he ar argues, quote, could effectively be used to extend the range of exploration further into space. Well, the governors, <laughs> the governors of the International Board, uh, the International Education Board, excuse me, of the Rockefeller Foundation found Hale's arguments to be persuasive. In June 1928, they awarded $6 million to Caltech to fund the construction of a 200-inch astronomical reflecting telescope that would be, in the words of the grant, as complete and perfect as possible. Well, the following month, the trustees of Caltech accepted the award, and by so doing, they put the Institute's considerable engineering resources at the service of George Hale's plan to build, as it turned out, 
its last great telescope. And of course, Hale immediately created an administrative organization to manage the project. The Observatory Council was established as the executive body having authority over the work of nearly a dozen subcommittees. Hale, chair, chair of the council, and the Solar Laboratory on the Caltech campus became the council's meeting place and headquarters for the project. Design work, model building, and planning. <clears throat> These essential steps had to be taken before any capital investments were made. An important part of the design process, Russell Porter's elegant drawing served to provide context and his work often facilitated communication within and between groups. But construction and all other larger capital projects remained on hold waiting resolution of an issue of the greatest importance. Indeed, everyone knew that the 200 inch mirror would be the pacing element for the entire project. And in 1928, no one knew if it were possible to fabricate the required two-ton glass disc. Seen here many years later, after, after an, an illuminization. In 1928, in fact, most people feared that the work could not be done. And to that extent, this picture is a spoiler alert. Well, as that may be, after several failed attempts to make a mirror by General Electric Corporation, the job of casting the 200 inch disc fell to Corning Glassworks and to the company's chief scientist, George McCauley. By 1931, opticians at Caltech and Mount Wilson had finalized the mirror's design so that upon receiving the contract from Caltech, Corning was able immediately to set up their manufacturing process. After several successful tests, Macaulay began preparations for pouring the 200 inch disc. And this image from late 1933, a frame to enclose the mold is nearing completion in the Corning factory. Why Corning? Well, Corning Corporation offered a range of consumer products, you know, baby bottles and test tubes and things like that. And they were made from their patented formulation of borosilicate glass that the company copyrighted under the trade, trade name Pyrex. Having a low coefficient of thermal expansion, Pyrex, was attractive to the telescope builders because it does not change shape significantly as the temperature changes. Caltech's design document specified that the back of the mirror would take the form of something like a honeycomb or a rib structure. In the recent image on the right, this structure can be seen as a pattern of voids beneath the unilluminized surface. On the left, a 1934 image of the mold shows that this structure was created by bolting ceramic plugs or cores to the bottom of the mold. The cores functioned to displace the molten glass as it was poured into the mold. Later, when the disc had cooled, workers chipped out the cores, leaving open spaces even the open spaces that we see on the right, excuse me. <clears throat> the cores in fact displaced more than 18 tons of glass. This weight reduction was essential because the telescope's mounting could not have supported the weight of a solid block of glass. And since no part of the structure is more than five inches thick, the voids allow air to circulate so that the mirror reaches ambient temperature more quickly. And finally, this structure 
actually increases the mirror's rigidity. Well, by late March 1934, construction of the mold was complete. <clears throat> and on May 25th, Macaulay and his employees began filling it with molten glass. Corning invited the public into the factory to witness an event of national significance. To many people then living through the depression, building the 200 inch telescope had come to represent an assertion of America's industrial competence and scientific leadership. It was an exercise in American exceptionalism that by March 1934 turned almost exclusively on Corning's efforts to fulfill contact Caltech's order for a two-ton Pyrex disc. Well, starting at about new, excuse me, starting at about 7 a.m., workers began scooping seven, 207, yeah, 2,700 degree molten glass from the melting ovens using ladles that moved on overhead tracks. Each ladle held 750 pounds of glass and once filled, the workers rolled the ladles to the mold where the glass was poured over the ceramic plugs. Each pour was followed by a refill at the melting oven. And so the process was repeated until the plugs were covered to the depth of six inches or more and the mold had reached capacity of 20 tons. Well, Macaulay kept close watch on everything that was taking place. By late morning, the mold was filled. And as far as he or anyone else could tell, for the operation appeared to have been a success. But then soon after lunch, first one, then two, and then several of the ceramic cores became detached and floated to the surface of the glass. Well, as would become apparent later, the hot glass had melted the steel bolts holding the ceramic plugs to the bottom of the mold. The 20 ton disc was ruined as the free floating plugs left deep scars in the disc's upper, upper surface. In the early spring of 1934, failure represented a substantial setback to the project. Needless to say, Corning Corporation was deeply and very publicly embarrassed, so much so that the failed disc shortly found an appreciative audience among the many paying visitors to the Corning Museum of Glass, where it still resides. In the aftermath, Pauli placed a failed disc in an annealing oven <clears throat> where it cooled slowly over several months. Examining the disc in early July, he understood two things. First, he realized that the cause of the failure, the melted anchor bolts, could easily be remedied. Second, he also realized that despite the issue with the cores, the failed disc was structurally sound. Solve the problem with the cores, Macaulay argued, and a successful 200 inch mirror blank could be poured on a second attempt. Well, the observatory council accepted this argument and approved a second pouring. Macaulay's technicians set to work rebuilding the mold this time attaching new ceramic cores to the bottom using hollow steel bolts, as seen here. With circulating, circulating fans positioned around the structure, Macaulay was confident that these hollow bolts could be kept cool enough to prevent a repeat of the earlier embarrassment. And so, on Sunday, Sunday morning, December 2nd, 1934. And the mold was ready and the melting oven full of hot glass. 
A few Caltech officials joined a group of Corning's managers on the factory floor. No one else was invited and no public announcements were made. Maybe the company reasoned everyone would be in church and maybe no one would notice what was going on. They did the second pouring in secret. Well, again, Macaulay kept watch as the mold was filled. When 20 tons had been labeled into the mold and no problems had been encountered, Macaulay quickly began the annealing process, a, regular, a regulated program of slow cooling that would prevent stresses from building up in the glass. And so after cooling for 10 months, Macaulay removed the disc from the oven and carefully examined it for cracks and deformations. And having examined it, he judged the disc a success. Everyone in the observatory council was relieved and gratified when in short order, experts from Caltech and Mount Wilson concurred with Macaulay's assessment. This view provides perspective on its size and structure. Macaulay is on the left, and when this picture was taken, the disc was being readied for shipment to Pasadena. Two years after that first boring, March 25th, 1936, Corning placed the disc in a protective steel container and drove it from the factory across town to the rail yard, where it was raised to an upright position and placed on a freight car specially built for the purpose by the New York Central Railroad. The following day, this container painted white and, and adorned with a bit of advertising. The disc started off on a 16-day rail journey to Caltech's optical lab in Pasadena. Moving at 25 miles an hour, stopping every night, the train traveled a route that had been carefully chosen to avoid low bridges and tight overpasses. With the first, as with the first pouring at the Corning factory, the rail journey also marked a major cultural event. In towns and cities along the way, schools were dismissed so that the students could go down to the railroad right of way to see the train as it passed, carrying its unique and historic cargo. And so the train finally approached the rail yards in East Pasadena on April 10th, 1936. The disc in its container was unloaded from the rail car and driven to the optical lab, arriving there on April 10th, 1936. And this is the crew. This is the crew of Caltech's optical lab under the direction of chief optician, Marcus Brown. They plan to spend the next several years grinding, figuring, and polishing Corning's 200 inch mirror, Pyrex mirror blank. Their job will be to transform this flat piece of glass into an F3.3 astronomical mirror having a paraboloidal curve accurate to within perhaps a few millions of an inch. The observatory council thought the job would require five or six years to complete. Well, in the spring, of 1936, as work on the mirror was getting started, progress now was also being made on other elements of the telescope project. In fact, the work that got started 1936 very much was en enabled by an event that had taken place in September 1934. You see, in that summer of 1934, 
Macaulay examined the failed disc and judged it to be structurally sound. This despite problems with the cores. This pronouncement made it clear that Corning possessed the skills and technology required to produce an acceptable 200 inch Pyrex disc. Well, that, that was a major turning point because with this, Hale's earlier concerns were resolved and the observatory council began allocating funds to other capital projects. Construction now became a central issue. The planners and the engineers needed land on which to build. And within two months of Macaulay's declarations regarding the disc, Caltech began purchasing land for the observatory on Palomar Mountain. In setting up the project's administrative structure in 1928, Hale established a site selection committee subordinate to the observatory council. This group moved quickly to identify a half dozen or more <clears throat> mountain locations where conditions of weather and of seeing might be suitable. Before the end of the first year, site committee hired Caltech graduate students and a few local residents to take meteorological readings and evaluate seeing quality at sites in Southern California and Arizona to take seeing measurements that could be compared across sites, the observers were provided with identical three inch refractors like the one above, excuse me. <clears throat> Only a few especially interesting and attractive sites were local residents hired to take daily readings throughout the year. One of those sites was on a plateau 5,600 feet above sea level on the northeasterly shoulder of Palomar Mountain. A rancher and local landowner named William Beach was hired to take these readings. And beginning in the fall of 1928, he did so continuously and quite conscientiously through mid-year 1934. As it turned out, Beach, in partnership with his stepbrother, owned most of the high range land that actually interested the planners at Caltech. Well, why was Palomar Mountain of interest? And why was it ultimately chosen as the site for the telescope? Well, many considerations were involved. <clears throat> Seeing conditions were good, although not as good is at Mount Wilson. This was a dark location. Hard to believe this was a dark location. It was as dark as any place in the region. The mountain was less than a day's drive from the offices and labs at Pasadena. And other things, other things aside, George Ellery Hale seems to have liked Palomar Mountain. Critically, Bill Beach's broad plateau, seen here in winter before construction began, was a rare feature in the geology of the region. Planners were attracted to this site from the beginning. They needed an elevated location on a mountain that directly fronted the Pacific Ocean. There should be nothing, they argued, to obstruct the even laminar flows of air that come from the ocean and no intermediate heights should be present to create turbulence. Hale's collaborators imagined, to build, imagined building a large campus on this level plain where extensive facilities could be made available to a dedicated and perhaps somewhat cloistered community of science, scientists from an early date. Members of Caltech's Site Selection Committee made no small plans, as it were, for this location. And as it happened, also from an early date, William Beach made it clear 
made clear his interest in negotiating a sales agreement. Well, with the principals positioned to reach a deal in late August 1934, the Observatory Council authorized Caltech's lawyer to begin making land purchases on the mountain. <clears throat> a meeting was held in Bill Beach's cabin on September 22nd. He and several other landowners met with representatives from Caltech, the County of San Diego, and the Cleveland National Forest. During the evening, agreements were signed that transferred ownership of 200 acres to Caltech, 120 acres for Beach, 40 from the Cleveland National Forest, and a further 40 from two other landowners. Additional purchases in the coming years would bring Caltech's holdings to its current total of 2,200 acres. Well, as that may be, for most, for almost a year, this land deal was in jeopardy. However well-suited Palomar Mountain might have seemed, the Observatory Council was nonetheless hesitant because no roads existed sufficient to support the expected weight and volume of traffic. If trucks carrying the mirror and all the other heavy parts of the telescope could, could not reach the plateau, then the telescope could not be built on the mountain. This contemporary image suggests what the roads on the mountain were like in 1934. Fortunately, the Board of Supervisors of the County of San Diego stepped in during the negotiations. The board members believed that by association, the county would gain a measure of prestige if the telescope were located within the boundaries of the county. In an effort to secure a deal, <clears throat> the supervisors agreed to build, at, at taxpayer expense, of course, a hard packed gravel road to the site. After the county's representative, representative signed the necessary papers at the meeting on September 22nd, work on the new road started slowly. It was delayed at first when local landowners challenged its proposed route and then was delayed further when the county ran out of money. Finally, almost two years after the papers were signed, the California Department of Highways stepped in. Canfield Road, as it's called, was completed by the state in June 1937 and with the opening of the Highway to the Stars, a, road, a passageway, a good quality all season road ran from the coast at Del Mar to the observatory's future location, Alamar Mountain. Well, as this all was going on, workers began arriving. They arrived soon after the agreements were signed and clearing and leveling operations began in the summer of 1935. When this image was taken later on June 30th, 1936, William Beach's high pasture was being transformed. A worker's tent city is seen in the foreground with temporary administrative buildings on the lower left and more permanent structures, including a water tower at the center left. The light colored patch of ground at the center marks the spot on which they will build the 200 inch telescope and its dome. The observatory needed all the facilities of a small town. Roads were cut and graded. A central administration building was constructed to provide space for offices and for a variety of maintenance and utility functions. Wells were dug and pipes were laid from springs on the northeast corner of the property. They were laid down to the water tower as seen here. The tower served as a central hub from which water was distributed to the domes and to the cottages Caltech was building. 
to house the permanent staff. Palomar Mountain had no connection to the electric utilities in the region. Therefore, three massive enterprise diesel engines were installed in the administration building to supply power to the campus. An arrangement that continued through the end of the 1950s. On June 30th, 1936, the footings for the foundation of the dome were in place. This is that light colored patch we saw in an earlier slide. With the footings in position, the telescope's massive base frame was erected at the center of the circle, seen here on September 28th, 1936. <clears throat> this structure is the foundation on which the 530 ton telescope rests. Isolated from the dome, piers descend from the corners of this frame down 22 feet into the bedrock of the mountain. So far, the Hale telescope has suffered no significant damage as a result of seismic activity. With the frame in place, <clears throat> construction soon began on the walls of the dome. The work proceeded rapidly and its steel frame was complete in the summer, late in the summer of 1937, so that the dome would be able to rotate Steel rails were installed at the top of the walls. Consolidated Steel Corporation of Los Angeles received the contract to build the dome. They installed 20, 32 four-wheel trucks on rails and then assembled the dome on top of the trucks. Here the dome central arch is nearing completion. An essential component, an essential component, the arch will carry the 60 ton crane needed to raise the telescope's heavy components up to the observing floor. At the same time, dome, as the dome of the 200 inch telescope was rising, work was proceeded, proceeding on buildings that would house two additional telescopes. On the left, a building to house the 18-inch Schmidt telescope is under construction in the summer 1936. In the image on the right, from late 1939, cranes are removing temporary spanning beams in preparation for assembly of a dome that will enclose the 48-inch Schmidt wide field telescope. The 48-inch telescope did not go into service until after World War II. But science operations on the 18-inch Schmidt began in the fall of 1936. For many years, Fritz Zwicky used it to search for supernovae. In 1993, Carolyn Shoemaker used this telescope to, dis excuse me, to discover comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 a year before it crashed into Jupiter. <clears throat> this telescope was decommissioned in 1999 and is now on display in the Observatory's Museum. And so by the fall of 1938, the walls and the dome were complete as were many of the observatory's ancillary structures. The grounds had been prepared and at last, the dome was ready to receive <clears throat> the 200-inch telescope. Well, as it turned out, the telescope, its tube, and its mounting were by then nearing completion at a factory in South Philadelphia. The Observatory Council had been working with Westinghouse Corporation since January 1936. A contract was signed later that year, and here the people who were building the telescope stand in the ring that will tie the trust members together at the lower end of the tube. They wanted to show how many resources, how many people, and how big the telescope was. Of course, one factor dominated 
Caltech's decision to have Westinghouse Corporation fabricate <clears throat> the structure of the telescope. Many of its parts would be large. And apparently Westinghouse was the only domestic firm that possessed hydraulic presses of sufficient size to handle the job. In this image from the fall of 1936, the lower truss ring from the previous slide is being forged in a press in the South, <clears throat> South Philadelphia factory. Of course, Westinghouse boasted about the immense scale of the work. They did so by publishing images such as this. Seen on July 8th, 1938, the mounts east, west, east and west support arms are joined to the yoke bearing at the south end. And the workers demonstrate, demonstrate the size of the structure they are building. Well, even now, the scale is impressive. Here, workers stand on the split ring bearing, also call, called the horseshoe bearing, that will be attached to the north end of the yoke. Westinghouse assembled parts of the telescope in the factory to make sure everything was aligned and would fit properly when the parts were brought to Palomar Mountain. The tube was completed in April 1937, even while the fabrication of the yoke and other parts of the mounting con continued for some time after. To celebrate their success in building the tube, Westinghouse held a dedication ceremony in the factory on April 30th. Among invited dignitaries, the presence of one guest in particular drew the crowd's attention. Albert Einstein attended. As far as we know, this event represents his only involvement with the 200 inch telescope project. As manufacturing and annealing operations were completed, Westinghouse began moving parts from the factory down to ships waiting at docks in the Delaware River. Here, the prime focus ring, which ties together the truss members at the top of the telescope is seen in late 1938 as it is being moved to the docks. As parts were loaded, the ships sailed at intervals down the East Coast, <clears throat> coast through the Panama Canal and then north to the port of San Diego. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here, a section of the horseshoe bearing is lifted from the hold of a freighter named the American Robin as it is secured to a trailer for the trip to Palomar Mountain. The new road, Canfield Road, was opened by the time <clears throat> parts of the telescope began arriving on the mountain. In this image, two tractors are linked together to haul a section of the horseshoe bearing to the observatory. One of the tractors is broken down under the heavy load on the steep road. As they reached the observatory, these parts were staged at the road junction on the west side of the dome. Here the prime focus ring is about to be moved into the dome on the ground floor. Then in the order required for assembly, the parts were raised from the ground level to the observing floor. Here, the prime focus ring, <clears throat> excuse me, and the lower truss ring are seen on the left, while a section of the horseshoe bearing is being raised through the hatch. In this image taken January 6th, 1939, the west arm of the yoke rests on a temporary scaffold as the east arm is raised into position. On February 17th, 1936, the yoke is complete. The telescope's tube will be installed on roller bearings between the two arms. Hydrostatic oil bearings at 
in the horseshoe to the north and in the yoke to the south will allow this three 530 ton structure to turn almost frictionlessly in right ascension. By mid-April 1939, the truss tube is in place, lacking only the prime focus ring at, the, at its top. In this image, the massive structure of the telescope contrasts with the person standing in the tube at the top of the pivot box. And the end of the year, the building and the dome are complete, as also is the structure of the telescope inside. Even so, a great deal still remained to be done. And over the next several years, engineers will spend long hours and many days installing and adjusting the telescope's control and tracking systems. As that, as that stage was reached that the mirror was moving ahead in Pasadena. Here, Marcus Brown and his team of, op of opticians <clears throat> are ready to begin work on the mirror in April 1936. They use this grinding machine in the optical lab to grind and polish the mirror's paraboloidal curve. Driven in circular motions around the disc, this grinding tool did the heavy work of removing five and a half tons of Pyrex. At the end of 1939, the work had gone well and the crew of the optical lab would see that a nearly perfect curve was forming in the upper surface of the mirror. Things went so well, in fact, that just 18 months later, in the summer of 1941, Marcus Brown stopped the work to assess the mirror's figure. The knife edge test showed excellent results. He was proud to tell his employees that they had successfully shaped the surface to within a first order approximation of a perfect paraboloid. Everything was on schedule and the end was in sight. But unfortunately, Marcus Brown, like many others, was unable to account for one looming factor. Yet yeah, World War II interrupted his plans as it interrupted also plans of many others. The mirror project was put on hold at the end of December, 1941, and work did not resume until December, 1945. And by then, few of Brown's original crew remained. To finish the job, he had to rebuild his organization and train a new crew. Well, in less than two years, he pulled, it, he pulled it together, and in fact, the job was complete in October 1937. At that point, the Observatory Council judged that the accuracy of the mirror's figure exceeded design specifications. The mirror was done as complete and perfect as possible. Marcus Brown was well satisfied with what his crew had accomplished. And to commemorate, he scratched his name into the glass at the edge of the Cassie Green opening. Then everyone helped prepare the mirror for its journey <clears throat> to Palomar Mountain. And this journey to the mountain began on the morning of November 18th, 1947 when the mirror left the optical lab, Pasadena, pulled by a 22-wheeled tractor trailer owned by Balea Truck Company. The mirror and its mounting cell and its packing crate weighed nearly 30 tons. 11 years and seven months had elapsed since Corning's two-inch Pyrex disc arrived at Caltech's optical lab. During that time, Brown's crew had used 31 tons of rouge, 
and abrasive compounds and had spent 180,000 working hours grinding and polishing the glass. Now as it left the optical lab, the truck carrying the finished mirror turned east on California Street before then heading south to join Highway 101. Several hours later, the caravan drove past Mission Capistrano and reached the Coast Highway at 12.30 p.m. The pace, whoop, go back one, how do I go back one? Yep, hang on, I bet. getting ahead of myself here. There we go. The pace then quickened on the Coast Highway. At 2.30 p.m., the mirror passed through Camp Pendleton, seen here with the Marine barracks in the background. Continuing south, the long line of trucks and cars turned inland when they reached the junction with State Route 78 in the city of Carlsbad. 20 miles remained before they reached Escondido, their stopping point for the night. Well, at five o'clock, the Belez tractor and trailer parked for the night at a hotel in Escondido. They had traveled 124 miles that day. Guards stood watch over the mirror as the drivers and their passengers got a night's rest. Escondido lies 37 miles by road from the observatory. The journey resumed next morning when the vehicles left the hotel at 5.15 a.m. In this image, Byron Hill, construction supervisor and the first superintendent of the observatory stands on top of the mirror crate. As seen here, driver Lloyd Green has, has stopped the lead truck in Valley Center to allow Balea employees to perform mechanical checks prior to beginning the ascent of the mountain. Here, the tractors are near the start of South Grade Road. It is 12 miles and a 4,600 foot climb to the observatory from here. Hill stood on the top of the box for the entire journey, and he had reason to do so. With one truck pulling and two trucks pushing, Hill coordinated the work of the three drivers. In particular, he shouted instructions to them so that they would all shift gear at the same time. Though a warm, sunny fall day had been predicted, the drivers met cold, wet, and icy conditions as they began the climb up the mountain. Even so, the drivers arrived at the dome at 11 o'clock in the morning and bettered the scheduled time by almost three hours. Driving the lead truck, Lloyd Green backed the mirror through the big doors on the west side of the dome, where it was later unpacked and lifted to the observing floor. Well, Marcus Brown did not follow the mirrored balance. His job was done, and in his place, Don Hendricks, chief optician at Mount Wilson Observatory, stepped in to oversee the remaining work. <clears throat> Soon after the mirror arrived on the observing floor, he applied a coating of reflective aluminum to its surface, mounted it in the telescope, and began optical testing. Unfortunately, the fabrication and shaping of the glass had not gone quite as planned. The mirror did not sag at its edges, as had been predicted. Its edges were too high, and almost two years of work would be required to bring them down. But two important things happened 
during those two years. First, Caltech held a dedication ceremony on June 3rd, 1948. That day, hundreds of invited guests sat under the telescope to hear Caltech President V. DeBridge announce that this powerful new instrument of science would be named the Hale Telescope. George Ellery Hale had passed away 10 years earlier. He never saw his greatest accomplishment. And the second important event happened several months later. In late September, 1948, science operations began on the 48 inch Schmidt Widefield Telescope. This instrument was built to conduct surveys and to create a catalog of faint objects for the 200 inch telescope to examine in detail. Currently, this telescope, now named the 48 inch Samuel Ocean Telescope, is involved in an automated transient survey program. In this image from 1950, Edwin Hubble applies tracking corrections during an exposure while he's smoking his pipe. Well, during the two years, Hendrix's opticians worked by tiny increments using methods that required great precision and ex exacting skill and limited and limitless amounts of time. To their credit, the tests showed slow improvements in the accuracy of the mirror's surface. And while that was true, eventually, the impatience of the astronomers overwhelmed the careful craftsmanship of the opticians. Of course, some influential people were waiting to use the telescope. And as Hendricks persisted in his efforts, it soon became apparent that the surface was so accurate that the disk's theoretical resolution was greater than the best the seeing conditions could provide. <clears throat> at this point, Edwin Hubble, seen here at the prime focus cage, demanded that the telescope be turned over to the astronomers. It was a call that the administrators at Caltech and Mount Wilson could not ignore. On the evening of January 26th, 1949, Hubble was given the honor of taking what is considered to be the Hale Telescope's first light image. He made a 15 minute exposure of NGC 2216, an object also known as Hubble's Variable Nebula. He expressed satisfaction with the result company, commenting only that seeing conditions had been less than ideal. Yet that image was a beginning. Work remained to be done before science operations could, be, could begin. And through the summer of 1949, balance and tracking problems were solved. A major issue with the mirror supports was fixed and performance was improved in many areas. Finally, after two nights of test, Ira Bowen, director of Palomar and Mount Wilson Observatories, declared that science operations would begin on November 13, 1949. Milton Humason, Hubble's assistant at Mount Wilson, was the first astronomer to use 200 inch Hale telescope. Science programs began with Hubble's, excuse me, with Humason's observations that evening in 1940, November of 1949. And the Hale Telescope has remained in service ever since. This instrument now supports the work of professional astronomers on average, 300 nights a year. And well, and it's been doing so for the last 74 years, which is to say research programs now in progress at the observatory rest upon technical, intellectual, and institutional foundations laid down by George Ellery Hale and his colleagues 
in the years of the Great Depression, Second World War, and the beginnings of the Cold War. And with that, we will take a look at the research programs that are sustained by the structure, excuse me, the structures that they built. In fact, well, what time are we getting to here? I've lost, entirely lost track of time. Um, well, let me try this one. This takes things in a bit different direction and we'll see how this goes. You see, the astrophysical programs now underway at the observatory touch upon many, perhaps most of the major questions of interest to the Global Research Committee. In fact, many of the individual projects going on now at Palomar may be grouped into six topical categories under which to a substantial degree, all or virtually all of the work done at the observatory since its opening may be subsumed. To answer the question, hey, what's going on up there now? What are they doing at Palomar Observatory? I have collected records of all the observing runs scheduled for the 200 inch telescope during the third quarter of 2023. This is a sample. This is just kind of a test. But using this three month sample, I counted the number of distinct research projects by month and across the three months. In fact, across all three months, there are 92 scheduled observing nights representing telescope time granted to 44 researchers, each dealing with either a distinct astrophysical question or a particular engineering problem. The affiliations of the 44 researchers are 21 from Caltech, 13 from JPL, four from Yale University, and six from the National Astronomical Observatories of China. The count of projects is not additive July to September because many projects <clears throat> receive nights spread over extended periods and a particular object may have entries in several months. Well, please be aware that each of the lines on the schedule represents a night that has been granted to an investigator by a time allocation committee. And please understand also that we get more requests for research time on the Hale telescope then we have nights to give out. That's why an allocation system is necessary. Of course, the term allocation may somewhat understate the issue. A night is awarded to a researcher based upon a number of criteria. As that may be, however, a committee's evaluation of the merits of an investigator's research proposal weigh most heavily in the decision-making process. Since the demand is greater than the supply, members of the committees must pass judgment on the proposals they receive and select only those they consider likely to contribute in some manner to the goals of science. Well, we need a specific example to try to see what's going on here. So let's look at a current project. Tonight, Dr. Yena Chesley of JPL will record the light curves and colors of several main belt comets. She will use the wafer scale camera for prime WASP. This instrument is a wide field imaging camera that provides an 18.4 by 18.5 arc minute field of view with a plate scale of 0.18 arc seconds per pixel. For each project that is awarded time, 
the investigator prepares an abstract <clears throat> of the proposal seen by the allocation committee. By convention, every re research <clears throat> excuse me, every research abstract begins with a statement of the problem. <clears throat> and every such statement is bound in some manner to a further statement designed to explain to the committee why the problem is important and why it must be solved. This preamble is followed by a discussion of the goals of the research and the methods to be adopted and the wider implications of the work. Now, all those things are contained in the abstract written by Dr. Chesley. All of them, except usually the abstracts contain, excuse me, a request for a certain number of nights with access to a preferred science instrument. That's not part of, those two things are not part of this abstract, but they do appear in the details for the run. Her run is run number 5200, zero, zero, and she has asked for, um, here is where she asked for the WASP instrument, and she specifies the start night and the end night she would like to use. In brief, the information in these documents, the detail sheet and the abstract, is sufficient to tell everyone what Dr. Chesley will be doing tonight on the Hale telescope. That is, if the cloudy skies now over the mountain <clears throat> clear long enough to allow observations to be taken for at least some portion of the night. Well, on cloudy nights in the more distant past, astronomers went downstairs and waited out the weather by playing rounds of pool on a table of professional quality that remains in place to this day. The last person I saw using that table was our superintendent, Rick Burris. So we know Dr. Chesley's research agenda for this particular evening, but our original question was much more general. The original question asked for a summary of the research being done here, or more bluntly stated, hey, what's going on up there? Well, the foregoing discussion does not provide an answer. Rather, everything said, said to this point is intended merely to put forward one obvious idea. From the schedule, we know what is happening every night of the year. And we know many important questions in astrophysics are being addressed. But as it concerns the Hale telescope, we see only a long string of seemingly unrelated research projects. Each has a problem statement, and each lists a particular set of, ob of objectives. <clears throat> but each is so specific that each project seems unique. So. These 44 projects, well, they're not unique. They're all related in some manner. As suggested earlier, the categories can be set up and common attributes can be identified. And these projects on schedule can be grouped into categories. Indeed, this is a subjective exercise, but much of the categorization is pretty obvious. Earlier, we use the work of Dr. Janet Chesley, who will be doing tonight as an example. Clearly, her study of the main belt comets falls within the fifth category on this list, the new solar system. I've looked at each abstract from the three months in our sample and categorized our list of projects in the manner seen here. You, you may wish to count, and your counts might be different, but I doubt they will be different by much. While this analysis 
above contains no surprises. I suggest that it is an interesting way to look at the research agenda, agenda and at the priorities of that agenda. And yes, this small sample from the current observing schedule is of limited interest. But things can get more interesting when you extend the time boundaries and take a longer sample. Even better, you can set up your own categories. Things begin to be very different, for example, when you set up a category limited to projects concerned only with exoplanet research. But all the major observatories have their schedules online. It is certainly nice to see that the neighbor, what the neighbors are doing. And all the Palomar data we looked at above is online at, I didn't put it in the slide. Um, you can Google the, uh, Google the observing schedule for Palomar Observatory. And um, I regret that I didn't get the URL in the slide. Anyway, as that may be, yes. You see, Tim is right. I've gone far too long and he's getting ready to shut down my Zoom session. Can you imagine? So here's my final item. The general public comes to the observatory on the weekends. We provide them with tours of the Hale Telescope, during which we describe its history and technology, and we show our guests how the telescope works. In particular, each of the docent presenters spends some portion of his or her allocated hour discussing the science that has been done here. I think it's fair to say that inevitably, we go from one specific accomplishment to another and from one noted astronomer to another. Yes, we killed Pluto, but beyond that celebrated event, we simply have no language with which to speak in general terms about the research that's being done here. Yet, as that may be here at Palomar, there is a further massive complication that in consideration of the limits that I have long ago exceeded, cannot be addressed in this short review. Time domain astronomy. We have four and soon to be five robotic survey telescopes that collect data nightly and support research in a way that is very different from what takes place at the Hale telescope. Different, but in the end, complementary. For now, this must be a story for another day. So the last word of the day, or at least the last word of this presentation goes to George Ellery Hale. Make no small plans. Dream no small dreams. It's his motto, and I suggest that Palomar Observatory perfectly captures his sense of think big, act big, and accomplish great things. Whew. Hey, thank you very much. Um, that's all I've got. And that may be enough. Thank you. Take questions, take comments. All right. That was really fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience here. I'll hand the mic off and uh, we'll probably, we have probably have some questions on Zoom too that are coming in on the chat. Uh, happy, happy to, please, please. So start questions. Somebody here? You got one right here? Do the science results that are that's taken there, does this stuff ever, is it available to the public? Science results, um, well, uh, I, I guess I, you would I, have to follow yes. the individual research project. Yeah, yes, because one way or another, probably yeah. the researcher will publish a paper and it will become available then. Um, the data given, Given the way we're set up here, the data is proprietary until the astronomer publishes it. Oh. And as okay, result, so you don't see it until they publish then. Yeah. All right. And you asked about exoplanets. Are, are they doing any exoplanet work? Well, yes. And in in the um, and in that listing I had of where I kind of tried to bring together. List of projects. 
Um, under, well, there's one category that contained all the exoplanet stuff. Um, cosmic chemistry and evolution, exoplanet studies um, illuminate the question ultimately of the evolution of stars and galaxies. And yeah, that stuff, that stuff is included in the third category I listed. All right, great. Is there a, is there a question from uh, the Zoom? Let's see. I don't see the Zoom gallery people. Anybody there? Another uh, question. Uh, hey, here you go. Uh, can you see that? Uh, from, uh, uh, can you see the questions on the screen or no? Well, if I bring up the chat, probably can. Um, I'm used to great LAAS presentations, but Flanders' presentation, in my opinion, takes the cake. I was spellbound. There's some kudos for you right there. Thank you. What's, I, the, I, I, what's the typical operational cost per hour of the instrument? In other words, how much do they charge? Oh, 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 we're we're cheap. Well, no, <laughs> not cheap. Um, one of the reasons the telescope is still in demand is that we charge significantly less than the other major telescopes. This telescope is paid for. Maintenance costs are relatively low. We charge about a tenth of what they charge on, let's say, the Keck telescopes. And well, if you've got a grant, you can you can get a lot of mileage on this telescope. This telescope is still big enough to do serious astrophysical work, even though it's no longer the largest telescope in the world. Well, kind of far from it, but it's a very serious research tool. And we, we convert starlight into data. We do so very efficiently and very reliably. And that's what the astronomers come here for the data they need for their research and their institutions pay us to generate the data. That's uh, great. We got a couple of questions in house. And uh, if anybody has a question, can you come over and we'll just pass the mic to the next person? Uh, yeah, about uh, 12 to 15 years ago when Mary Brown was president of LAAS, uh, shortly, in fact, one of the reasons why Carol and I joined the club is Mary Brown set up a VIP tour of Palomar, and I'd like to see if we could get that done again. I think that was absolutely spectacular uh, tour that we had. It was a special tour that they gave to LAAS members at the time. Just wondering if we could set that up again to do that. Uh, please, yes. Um... Best somebody contact me by email, um, flanders at caltech.edu, and we'll get it started. Um, there are an extensive set of permissions I need to enter buildings that normally are not open to the public, particularly 48 inch Samuel Ocean Telescope. So there's, there's some. Um, there's some bureaucracy involved, particularly in the robotic telescopes. But contact me and we'll get it done. Okay, one more question from here and then maybe we could take one more from the Zoom and then we got to do a makeshift raffle. <laughs> a two-part question. Yeah. Uh, the first one is how did you go from like the 1940s to modernize um, using the data that you receive and the science from the telescope? Um, I saw there was like a computer room. And the second part of my question is, uh, what is the most celebrated recent um, science that you've done um, at Palomar? Celebrated. Celebrated science. I suppose no one remembers the green comet from back in February. That was, well, that's a whole nother story. Um, 
You see, we don't we don't tend we don't tend to discover things. The role of the Hale Telescope now pretty much is doing follow up validation kinds of studies. Um, we check, we do spectroscopy on suspected exoplanet uh, systems, uh, things that have been discovered elsewhere, and we don't tend to get a lot of a lot of attention as such. What's the most recent? Well, it's all it, it's all part of the science that right at the end there I mentioned is is just beyond scope of what we talk about tonight. Most of the discover all well effectively all of the discoveries are made through made at optical wavelengths through the Zwicky transient facility and are made by the 48 inch Samuel Ocean telescope. And the telescope has discovered all kinds of things since that system went into the, went into service. Um, discovered an asteroid whose orbit is tar entirely within the orbit of Venus, things like that. There's been a lot of that. Not exactly startling stuff, perhaps, but things that have made the headlines. And uh, hey, good. We got. Uh... Time for maybe one more question from the web, and then that's it. Is there one more question that you had up? Just yeah. Order. Uh, how many types numbers of detectors are available for the scientific work? So, how many how many instruments can you put on there that are available, or do the research projects bring their own? Well, some research projects bring their own. But at the moment, the observatory supports nine detectors, nine instruments on the Hale telescope for use by the astronomers. And you're going to ask me to list those, right? Um, no, no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. We, we, we got to get. To, we got to get. We got to get to the raffle. Let's give them yeah. a round of applause. This was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Hey, and the, the link for the raffle is in the chat for those of you online. Okay, so the people online, we're going to see uh, a spreadsheet from Spencer. And we're, because we didn't have our tickets tonight, we're passing out numbers. And I have the numbers here. So I'm going to pick a random number off of this sheet. And what? You're numberless? He's on his way. We're not starting yet. <laughs> Well, with that, I will say thank you. Hey, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, back to me. All right. All right. So uh, I'm here. I can see myself. I see where I am. I don't want to be behind this thing. I'm going to be over here. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions for me? No? Good. <laughs> We we have to cut this short because we have a, a hard a hard time to get a hard deadline to get out of here. We have to be closed by ten. So I'm trying to get everyone done, get the raffle over by you know almost nine fifty. Maybe give us all ten minutes to walk out. They got to put all this stuff away. A few things. Let me know when you get all the tickets out. Actually, Spencer, because we don't have Alicia tonight uh, and we didn't bring anything here, we're going to give all. Eight with four here and four on there. Uh, we're going to give everybody a twenty-five dollar. No, Alicia's here. Gift certificate. Alicia Please? is here. Yeah, she's here. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, when did you come? You weren't here earlier. All right. Well, then I guess we still need to give the people in house here online prizes because we didn't bring lasers. All okay. right. Right. And the, peop the people that do win here uh, will need to give me your name and uh, email address so we can contact you for, I guess, I guess on the online ones, you buy it and we re reimburse you. Is that how it goes, Alicia? Uh, Alicia? I'm back. Sorry. It just dropped me. Sorry about that. We're good. Okay. okay. Come on.
Everybody has a number? A one short? When people get stuff on the web, do they just buy it and we reimburse them? Uh, no, we buy it for them and we send it to them. I didn't understand that. She says we, we buy, buy it. it for them and we send oh. it to them. Okay, that's why he needs your email address because she needs to know what you want. And yeah. is it twenty five dollar for the online? If we do purchase? Amazon gift cards, if the LA store, it's a fifty dollars. Okay. Yeah. So there's other things too. So it just depends. All right, we're on. really close uh, on both. All right, so yeah. we've got twelve. Only twelve people sign up online. So. I, I need to close this out pretty soon if you've got a hard deadline. So everybody has a link for registering online. I'll just resend it one more time. Okay, I'll close this out in about uh, 45 seconds. Okay, uh, so we've got all of the numbers here, especially you want to do the first one on the on the spreadsheet. Okay, hang on. Just uh, well, why don't you do the one in, in house because that, let me. I need a, a minute to collect the uh, the ones sure. on the spreadsheet. We we can do a couple of them here and then do a couple okay. there. All right. All right. Okay. So I don't know who's got what number. So I'm gonna. Oh, I'm just gonna pick one. I don't know who got what number. <laughs> so this is totally random. Twenty two. All right. All right, let's do another one. So you'll need to give your email address and then we'll, yeah. Uh, okay, how about, uh, how about I give him the pen and I don't know. Okay, so he you won proving, a constellation drink. Hmm? Okay. Should I do another one here? Yeah. All right. How about number 28? 28. Come on down, give us your email address. Let me give us a pen. Give a pen. Give a pen. Give a pen. Okay. So that's two here. Okay, I'm ready to do online if you want. Okay, I want you to do two online and then we'll do two more here and you can have the last two. Okay, so let's see. Everybody see the share, screen share? Okay. So Brett Tam is the, is the uh, first one. Okay. Okay. Am I in a running? In a drawing? All right. She, he wants to know what she won. She won an item from the LAS store. Oh, Thank wow. you. Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> Next one is uh, Pablo Lewin. Hey, Pablo. Got a present. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Whatever it is. You is it, won. He won $25 off of a 60 inch half night. So the twenty five dollars will be provided by LAS for that. So twenty five dollars off of a sixty inch night. Yep. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So that's those two, and I'll do. Uh, I'll do two. Eleven. You're done. All right. Come on down. Give us your email address. And thirty five. <laughs> Raphael. All right, so um, we got everyone, we got the four people here and two more online and we'll have all of our wonderful parting presents. Mm -hmm. so you want me to out. do two online now? Yeah, I did four here, you can do two more and we'll be done. Okay. All right. We're doing two more, okay. James Anderson. Mm. 
So while we're doing all this stuff here, uh, I wanted to let you know <laughs> that Thank you. I thought we were going to lose members during COVID, and we didn't. We actually gained members. What, what did he, what did you, uh, astronomy win? hooks came out, and people bought telescopes, and so um. uh, numbers went actually up a little bit. And in the past, okay, I think three years, uh, the membership has doubled. We're a little bit over a thousand members right now. So next one, I'm sorry, you want? Yeah, to that's really good, isn't it? And so uh, we we've been trying to find if there's another bigger. Uh, yes, sir. Alicia, we're yeah. waiting for the next one. So James Anderson got that one. So want want to do one more, right? Uh, sure. We can okay. So what did he win? One more. What did he win? Um. Well, first I want to clarify: we're not giving out any lasers, right? This time. Yeah. No lasers. No lasers this time. Okay. Um. Then he won a red flashlight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. And Stephanie Madison. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Stephanie Madison won the, it's the next one. Oh. So what was the question, Spencer? I said Stephanie Madison is the next, uh, it's the last. Yay. Oh, Yay. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, unless cool. anybody has any questions, uh, I don't really have any more announcements. Uh, so we can begin to adjourn, can hang out outside for a few minutes. Thank you, everybody, very much for coming. Uh, you know, you can you can bring guests, too, when you come back here. Here, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Just want to remind you that our next start party here at Griffith Observatory would be um, coming up September... 23rd will be here and you can arrive with solar scopes at two o'clock and we are going to 11 o'clock is that correct tim we're supposed to be able to go to 11 o'clock hopefully we'll find out and then the next one will be october 21st on a saturday night then november 18th and december 16th all right that's good because that'll be on the uh the zoom for people online that want to see that information all right, everybody, thank you very much.